everybody, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 41 in the podcast series. Uh, for those of you who are new, welcome. This is a podcast about knitting and spinning and a lot about garment constructions. I love working on sweaters and pattern modifications, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you'll find it here. Um, I am coming to you from Urbana, Illinois, and I'm a professor at the University of Illinois there. Uh, let's see, you can find me online just about everywhere as Knitting the Stash, uh, on Instagram and YouTube, obviously, um, on, where else? On the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com. And uh, I just like always to say a big welcome back to all of you who have stayed with me for so long. I mean, 41 episodes is a long time. We've been going at this almost two years now. Uh, and that's so exciting to me. I've met so many nice folks and learned so much from you guys. Uh, and I just really appreciate all the comments and all the emails and all the messages. So thank you so much. Keep them coming. Uh, today, in the episode today, uh, I was a little worried that this might be a thin kind of episode because I've been doing so much sample knitting and test knitting that's all secret and I can't tell you much about it except that it's for June Cashmere and LB Hin Knits. Uh, but those things are... All of those patterns are coming out in September, so uh, in the next podcast hopefully you will see some really cool finished objects and I'll be able to tell you all about the new um, patterns from these folks that are coming out. But I actually have a lot to talk about today that is not sample and test knitting. Uh, I have some pearl and ply uh, a work in progress to talk about and a giveaway from them. If you haven't heard about pearl and ply, you can go over to my blog and check out the interview I did with them uh, that just came out on this last Friday. They're an awesome uh, two-woman show uh, and they produce some beautiful colorways. So I'll talk about that and we'll do a giveaway. Uh, I have a little bit of news about the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival, which is coming up next weekend, uh, and I'll share that with you. And uh, let's see what else. I've got lots of news and notes about Kiviet fiber. Last time around we talked about cashmere, this time it's Kiviet. Uh, I had a really lucky <laughs> draw on getting some Kiviet fiber, and I want to tell you all about it. So, so let's jump right in. In. Uh, first things first, Pearl and Ply, uh, which is a fairly new uh, indie dyer company out of Texas, sent me some gorgeous yarn to try out and to share with you guys. So this is, if you haven't, if you've been on Instagram at all, I'm guessing you've seen uh, the launch for Pearl and Ply. This is uh, Brittany Simmons and Melody uh, Dowlern. Make sure I pronounce the last names correctly, I hope. Uh, and like I said, they're coming to you out of Amarillo, Texas. Uh, you can find them on Ravelry, on Instagram, uh, by email. They have a nice website up where you can shop for their yarns, all that kind of good stuff. Um, they sent me some yarn to show you and to share with you. And so let me show you these guys. This is the Romantic Colorway, Romantic Getaway Colorway which I think you can get pretty good there. It's these beautiful greens and purples and some browns in there, speckly kind of yarn, just gorgeous. And this is their singles. So this is the 100% uh, superwash merino single ply, uh, about 400 meters or 437 yards per 100 grams. And this is romantic giveaway. Getaway. It's for the giveaway. That's why I'm calling it romantic giveaway. <laughs> romantic getaway. And they also sent me some other ones to test out. This, what you see here, is a Swanky Elephant, which I absolutely love. And I'm going to show you up close. I've got it wound into a cake right now. I think you'll be able to see. It's a beautiful gray-purple with these splashes and hints of, uh, like there's some teals in here and some uh, oranges, some blues, some things that are kind of unexpected combinations, but they are so beautiful together. And I just wanted to test out this yarn so that you'd be able to see it in an actual pattern. So I cast on the Vary the Gate, right? Perfect pattern for variegated yarn uh, by Cassiopinka. And I've made Cassiopinka patterns before um, that I've talked about on here, but look at the way this yarn knits up. It just, this pattern uh, is a slip stitch pattern, so it helps with uh, variegated yarn to kind of break up uh, and make the color look a little bit more regular, helps with color pooling, all that kind of stuff that might happen with variegated yarn. Um, and I hope you can see this because the colors are just incredible um, in this yarn and it's producing this really cool kind of striped effect with this pattern. Now that's the front side. On the back side of Vary the Gate it looks like this. 
which is a much more kind of like warm, squishy, splashy, pearly looking pattern on the back, which I, I love as well. I thought at the beginning I would only like the right side of this, but I really kind of, I quite like the back side as well. Uh, but you can see the color pulling happens very differently here where the stitches, um, these, this is the side where the stitches, uh, the, the slips aren't as clear, right? It's more pearly. And on this side, you can see how the slip stitches are changing that color around. And what, what a slip stitch does when you execute a slip stitch, and you can see them sitting here on the top of this right now, the stitches that have been worked or haven't been worked. What it means is that if you have a certain color of yarn going across and you slip a stitch without working it, whatever new yarn you had coming across, that color is not gonna show up in that place on the pattern because you've slipped the last stitch, you've not worked it with any kind of new yarn. So when you come back to that stitch to work it on the wrong side, uh, you, you, or on the right side, depending on the pattern, uh, you've actually skipped a kind of um, repeat of the yarn. So if your yarn is kind of running along this way and you're knitting it up, you skip a certain number of color repeats by slipping those stitches and then only working them on the next row. So that's how this pattern works to kind of break up color. And I just love the way that it looks in this swanky elephant. I think this is going to be just a perfectly classic shawl for work, uh, something to wear with just about anything. It's since it's this beautiful gray purple, purple's my favorite color. <laughs> Uh, it's this beautiful gray purple. It'll go with just about everything. You could throw it on with something that was very monochromatic and kind of black or gray and it would add a pop of color. Uh, or you could really pick out some of these beautiful teals and purples and yellows and kind of play with that and then this would bring out those colors. Um, so I love it. I love the way this yarn knits up. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, the other colorway that they sent me is Hologram, which I'll show you here. This is a little bit more of a kind of like a neon, uh, it's got some really bright patches in it, and I think this one I'm going to knit up maybe into a kind of hat. Uh, I'm try to find a variegated yarn hat pattern or make one up myself with some slip stitches uh, to kind of really play with this colorway and let you all see what it looks like. So that is Pearl and Ply, and I highly recommend them. Like I said, I did an interview with them, um, which is over on the blog, um, and you can check that out but you can also have some of this yarn for yourself. So for the giveaway, what I would love to do is I'm gonna offer it on all the platforms. So here on YouTube, on the blog, uh, over on Instagram, I'll put up a snapshot and you can enter any of those places that you want or that you have an account. We'll do one in the Ravelry thread as well. Uh, and basically what I want to know is something that I think Britt and Mel of Pearl and Plow would be interested to hear. You can answer one of two questions. One, what's your favorite colorway? That one's fun, because you just go to their website, check out all of the different colors in the shop, and just say which one you like the best. Uh, these two are Romantic Getaway. I've showed you Hologram. This is Swanky Elephant. Uh, so many beautiful ones to choose from. But you could also tell me and tell Brit and Mel of Pearl and Ply what kind of base you like for uh, indie dyer yarn. Because I'm always really curious to know, do you like working with a singles uh, that's like 100% superwash merino? Great for shawls um, and other kind of close to the uh, face, close to the skin kind of projects. Um, do you like a sock yarn? How many plies? Uh, are you interested in worsted weight, DK weight? Like, what do you like to see from indie dyers? What kind of weight, what kind of composition of yarn? Um, because the base really matters. You know, if you have a silk mixed with a merino, it takes the color differently. Superwashes take the color differently than non-superwash wool. So what do you like to see in your yarn base? <laughs> you can answer either of those questions on any of the platforms to be entered to win one of these two skeins. I'm going to draw two winners so that two people will have a chance to check out Pearl and Ply's yarn. Um, and in the meantime, I hope you enjoy kind of checking out their... Um, interview and just looking around their shop. If you need someone to follow on Instagram, that is definitely an Instagram feed to follow because they are really good at photography and their yarns just look beautiful. I always enjoy opening up my feed and like seeing some picture from them pop up because it's just like, it's like eye candy. It's really, really fun. Um, so thank you, Brett and Mal, for sending along some yarns to test out. And I'm so excited about this giveaway to let other people get in on your yarns. And that is 
that's pearl and ply for you and I'm pretty excited about them and I'm pretty excited about this shawl because the semester has started and I need some of these beautiful accessory items to kind of dress up my boring academic practical workwear <laughs> to be quite honest <laughs> okay uh let's see what's next oh uh wisconsin sheep and wool this is a quick note for you guys uh if anyone's gonna be at wisconsin sheep and wool and you want to hang out let me know because i'd love to meet meet you guys there uh anyone who's gonna be there um i will be there uh in particular on saturday afternoon and my guild and i will be there on sunday morning because we're participating in the sheep to shawl competition yay <laughs> I don't know, this is, uh, I'm, I usually don't get into competitions and whatnot, you know, I've never been a marathon runner, I'm not like a, I don't join into that kind of stuff, but when it comes to yarn and spinning, I've been like really into it. It's like Spinzilla has come and gone a couple years and I've done that. Uh, this year I can't do it because I'll be in Germany. Ah, I know, so sad. Uh, but my guild put together a sheep to shawl group and so there are eight of us who are going to Wisconsin Sheep and Wool. I think a few folks are gonna camp out. Some other folks are gonna um, sleep in. They, they're renting their, like a trailer that they're gonna, like an RV type trailer they're gonna sleep in. Spencer and I are gonna go up and uh, camp at a, the state fair, or state campgrounds. That's kind of a little bit up north of there. See some friends in, in uh, Madison. Uh, but I'll be around and I'd love to meet some of you guys. For those of you who don't know, a sheep to shawl competition means that all eight of us are going to be in a tiny area of the, I think it's the activity center up at the state fairgrounds where they, where they run the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival in Jefferson, uh, Wisconsin. And we, you're not allowed to bring any like electric spinners or electric carters or anything like that. It's all by hand. We have a fleece from Kathy at Seven Sisters Farm. And I've talked about Kathy's fleece on here before. They're beautiful. Uh, long wools, and this one happens to be a long wool crossed with um, a Lester long wool crossed with Corydale. Beautiful fleece. Uh, we're going to be taking that fleece. It's already been washed and dried, and we have to cart it or comb it, however we want to do it. I think we're carting it. Uh, spin it into singles, ply the singles, and then get those singles over to our weaver who has designed a pattern that she will be weaving <laughs> during this competition. All of this happens from about 9 in the morning until I think 1 or 1.30 in the afternoon. So it's a quick four hour competition where we go from fleece to finished shawl, ideally, right? Uh, and all eight of us are kind of psyched up. We've been practicing. Uh, and this is the Champagne Urbana Spinners and Weavers Guild, if anybody's interested. Uh, so my crew will be out there in Wisconsin with me this year as well. Uh, and if you want to come just meet up, if you want to come cheer us on, just say hello, you want to go on a little shopping spree with me <laughs> and go wander through the vendor booths together, that sounds like fun. Just get in touch. My email is knittingthestash at gmail.com. Uh, you can leave a comment here too, but you can always just send me an email and say, hey, I'll be there. I'd love to meet up and I'll try to put together a group of folks who are going to be there and some times for us to get together. So yeah, Wisconsin sheep and wool. Rock. So let's turn for a minute to a little bit of fiber fun. Uh, I was fortunate enough um, in the last week or so to uh, come into some musk ox fiber uh, from a guild mate. And I'm really excited about this fiber because it's one of those fibers that I've kind of dreamed about working with forever. Uh, and it's one of those fibers that's also kind of scarce and rare and expensive and hard to come by. So it was a kind of fiber that I figured I'd never actually get to work with. Uh, so to have a little bit of it from her stash is a pretty amazing um, acquisition. <laughs> and uh, I thought I'd spend a few minutes here talking about Kiviet, talking about mu musk oxen. This is going to be one of those casts where I'm just sitting here saying musk oxen. It's like a, it's a tongue twister, right? Like say it, say that three times fast. Uh, but I thought I'd get into some of the details of musk oxen and Kiviet for you guys. Uh, since last week we talked about cashmere, uh, this time around, our, our fiber fun comes from Kiviet. Musk oxen produce Kiviet fiber, uh, which is their undercoat. Um, and generally speaking, the uh, captive uh, farmed musk oxen uh, are combed. So there are no animals killed in this process, just like a good shearing. Uh, you just get a, a musk oxen in these really small kind of corrals and the person combs through their, 
coat and pulls out the under layer. Then you have to kind of pull out the guard hairs um, as a way to process that uh, fiber. So this is Kiviet and it tends to have a kind of silvery gray to grayish brown kind of uh, color to it. You don't want to bleach it because it'll mess up the, the fiber. So you're only going to find Kiviet in this kind of natural color or a darker dyed color. You're, never, you're not going to find it in a white or a cream color. Uh, it's incredibly soft. Uh, the micron count on Kiviet, I think is, let's see, uh, I want to say it's 11. I'm looking at my fleece and fiber source book here. Uh, I think it's a, about 11 microns. So we're talking right up there with um, it better than perhaps cashmere even. One of the finer fibers in the world. And it's become a little bit easier to source uh, in the last five years or so, maybe the last decade. Uh, due in part to some conservation efforts into some captive farms that are in Alaska and some organizations that are making it more available to folks like us who want to spin it or want to work with the yarn. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Kiviet. And Kiviet is, uh, let me show you this. This is some of the information that's coming from here, which is the Fleece and Fiber Source Book which is by Deb Robson and Carol Acarius, which is an amazing resource for anybody who's interested in uh, fleece, fiber, thinking about different animals, different breeds, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and some of my information is coming from this book, so which this is Musk Ox Babies of the Far North. And this was written by Helen Von Ammon, and she actually spent um, some time up at, uh, up in Fairbanks, um, at the large animal research station where a lot of uh, these musk oxen live and her story is truly adorable it's about these two baby musk oxen here they are you see them on the front another there they are in the back <laughs> they're really really truly adorable uh, and they're kind of adventures up in the north but she has a nice preface here that i i think is kind of um, useful and it it jives with the information that uh, i read in the fleece and fiber source book. So I thought I'd share a little bit of that history with you. So it turns out Kiviet, um, or it turns out Kiviet's the fiber. Musk oxen uh, lived something all the way back to the ice age in terms of the fossil record. So like, like right alongside woolly mammoths, basically. So we're talking about animals that live up in the really, really cold far north. Um, and just like with cashmere, it's like the colder the climate, the warmer the fiber that the animals are producing to keep themselves alive in this kind of like arctic sub-zero temperature. Um, there are, uh, basically we wiped them out in Alaska, sadly, uh, in the 1800s. And it was in, let's see, I think it was, I'm trying to read my notes here, uh, but they, they kind of continued to live in parts of Canada and up in Greenland. Um, and then in 1931, uh, some researchers reintroduced about 30, 30 some calves to the Alaska region as a way to kind of repopulate and rebuild um, the musk oxen that live in Alaska. And <laughs> apparently, I, I didn't look into this, I'm really curious to look a little bit more into this, but apparently uh, due to some funding constraints and whatnot, those animals were set kind of free um, onto Nunavik Island uh, and they lived as wild creatures for the next 30 years or so until they were recaptured, uh, about thir another 30 of them were recaptured um, in about 1964 and brought into the research station uh, again. So it's this great story of like these wild creatures, sadly, you know, driven to extinction in Alaska by humans and, and uh, hunting and then um, repopulated. Uh, and as far as I know, the the population of uh, musk oxen is doing fairly well at this point. There's, I think, upwards of 100,000 100, of them uh, in those places in Alaska and Canada and Greenland. So they're doing all right. Uh, and there are a few places that uh, you can actually get um, kiviet fiber nowadays. It was really hard to find um, back then. There, there are uh, places you can get it now. You can get it at the Woolery in small quantities. Uh, you can get it at, through Arctic Kiviet, which has some vendors in different places. I know when I was in um, 
Fort Collins, Colorado at a really beautiful little local yarn shop up there. Uh, it was the first time I ever touched Kiviet yarn, and it was a tiny little skein of it. I mean, this is this is fairly expensive stuff. It's hard to find, and it's expensive. Um, and I touched it for the first time, and it was like, it's like the softest yarn you've ever felt. And you feel like you're holding this precious, if you're a fiber person, you're like holding this precious thing that's equivalent to like diamonds and gold for all of those fiber people. Uh, so it was pretty amazing to have seen it there. Then to have, uh, to find a little bit of this fiber um, at the sale is also pretty incredible. So I'm excited to, um, yes, it's valuable, but it's it's like the value is the fact that I'm going to now, I actually have the opportunity to spin some up and knit with it, uh, which I probably never would have had because it's, you know, almost prohibitively expensive and difficult to find. Um, you can buy uh, finished pieces. There are, there are a couple great collectives. One of them is the uh, Umigmak Muskok Producers uh, Cooperative that's in Alaska. And they're a group of women who take the fiber and knit various objects like hats and tunics and things like that that you can buy from them. And, and in buying them, you're supporting their cooperative, which is giving uh, giving back to kind of native Alaskans uh, and the native Alaskan community, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but for the rest of us, we can get the fiber and we can get the yarn and we can knit and spin with it. Now, one of the cool things about Kiviet is how warm it is. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I mentioned this, but it's something like eight or nine times warmer than wool. And we all know that if you put on a good wool sweater, you're going to be toasty. So having Kiviet in there is uh, an added bonus. Um, some people think, I mean, because Kiviet is so, such a rare, hard, hard to find fiber, oftentimes people will blend it with different um, things. And uh, Deb Robeson talks about in her book that even if you blend 20% Kiviet into some merino for spinning uh, or for knitting, you're gonna uh, get some of the effects of that really, the warmth that you'd get from Kiviet. So my plan with, with this fiber is, I'd love to spin some straight, and I really wanna make a really warm hat for myself. Uh, but I'd also be really curious to kind of blend this with a little bit of merino and have it go a little bit farther. Uh, and the other reason to blend it with some merino is that Kiviet doesn't have any uh, scales and it doesn't have any crimp, so it doesn't have any memory. Um, and if you were to just spin and knit from straight Kiviet yarn or fiber, 100% Kiviet, um, you'd have something with like super drape because it's just gonna kind of be a little mushy. It's not gonna have any memory to it. Um, and it also, because it doesn't have any scales, it, it won't felt, uh, it's, it's just, it's a different kind of fiber that way. If I blend it with some merino, it'll have some crimp, it'll have some memory, uh, and it'll have the ability to produce some structure in the garments. So I think, I think I wanna go a little bit both ways and see what happens with this. I just wish I could like, put it through the camera to you so you could see just how soft and feel just how soft it is. It is, it's like a little, it's like an alpaca cloud on a crack. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So that's the Kiviet story for you. And I'm pretty excited about having found just a little bit of that. What else do I have for you? I have one last thing for you, and that is the fact that the Knit Together project is coming to an end. It's September 1st today as I'm filming, and uh, I've accepted. I think the last of the squares have rolled in, uh, and I have one last square to share with you from Tawny Mc McEwen, uh, and this is her square, which is a beautiful, cabled, creamy square. And she writes, this is uh, the Knit Together project most of you guys know, uh, is folks sending me 8 by 8 squares that I'm going to make an, a blanket out of, and if you submit a square, then you're uh, entered to win the entire blanket once it's finished and put together. Uh, all that I asked is that you had a good story about your yarn or your pattern so that you could share those and this, this blanket would have a lot of meaning for all of us. So this is what Tani said. She said, hi Melissa, this is my finished square. I'm still new to spinning, but this was my first yarn I made. And we've had so many folks send in their first yarns uh, in these squares and that's just so exciting. She said, I decided to make this yarn in Navajo ply fashion. My pattern is a Celtic braid. I thought long and hard about my story and this block is me. I'm half Navajo, half Caucasian. My father is of Scottish descent, so is my husband. So everyone around me was excited when I told them that I wanted to make my own yarn. Long story short, Navajo ply, Celtic braid. <laughs> 
Thanks for doing this, she says. I'm excited to see uh, where I go in my next new adventure of spinning and participating in the fiber community. So thank you, Tony. This is a beautiful, beautiful square and it will fit right into the Knit Together Project blanket. Thank you so much for sending it in. And with that, uh, it's wild to say, but the Knit Together Project will be one of my projects coming up as I try to piece together those squares that I've gotten from all of you. There's a huge bin back there full of squares that I'm looking forward to going through and trying to figure out the puzzle pieces of how they're gonna go together. Uh, and I'll keep you updated on that as we go. I think, I think that's it for episode 41. Uh, no secret or test knitting <laughs> for you guys yet, but that will be in the next episode, I promise. Uh, please head on over to any of the platforms that you uh, tend to frequent to enter the giveaway for the Pearl and Ply Beautiful Skeins. Uh, check out, uh, leave me a comment with the answer to either one of those questions. Telling me about yarn bases that you like from Indie Dyers or telling me just which Pearl and Ply colorway is your favorite. And I will be happy to send one of these skeins off to the winners of the contest. Uh, the giveaway will close in two weeks, as usual. And I will make an announcement so you all know who won. In the meantime, I wish you all happy knitting and spinning. And I hope to see you at Wisconsin Sheep and Wool. Hit me up and let me know if you're going to be there. All right, until next time. See you later. <laughs>